Welcome to our weekly study session for Saturday, January 8th, 2022. Uh, this is our first session of the new year. Um, and today's session is pretty significant because we have a very special guest here today, and that is Comrade Joma. Uh, Comrade Joma is an activist, educator, and socialist revolutionary from the Philippines. He's known internationally for his involvement with the Filipino national liberation struggle, as well as his intellectual contributions to the international communist movement. In 1968, he led the movement to reestablish the Communist Party of the Philippines under the ideological banner of Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, and anti-revisionism, and scientifically applied it to the concrete material and social conditions of the Philippines. During this time, he also founded the National Democratic Front and the New People's Army. In 2001, Comrade Joma established the International League of People's Struggle, which is an organization of progressive activists, which works to coordinate anti-imperialist, social, and political movements across the globe. Comrade Joma has also published a number of books, including Philippine Society and Revolution, Critique of Philippine Economy and Politics, the struggle for national democracy and basic principles of Marxism-Leninism. He's one of the world's foremost intellectuals in the international struggle against capitalism and imperialism. He serves as an inspiration to young revolutionaries around the world, and we are honored to have him here as our guest today. <clears throat> um, as for us, we are a group of comrades who read, analyze, and discuss uh, Marxist texts in order to develop our understanding of the various revolutionary liberation movements in the world today. We work to develop our understanding of both basic and more complex Marxist concepts through group study, criticism and self-criticism, and principled ideological struggle. Our discussion group emerged after the fifth anniversary memorial of Alton Sterling. Alton was murdered by Baton Rouge police in 2016. And in 2021, families that lost loved ones to police terrorism converged with revolutionaries from around the country to celebrate his life and inspiration. Alton is very much responsible for us being here today, and we give special thanks to him and to his aunt, Veda Sterling, who carries Alton's memory with a revolutionary spirit that inspires us all. Our group also gives special thanks to a lead organizer of Alton's Memorial and a lead organizer of the study, Ignacio de la Sol. Ignacio set the tone early on that this discussion group was not just for comrades with advanced knowledge of Maoist principles, but he would be accessible and formative to proletariat revolutionaries that were new to revolutionary theory. Uh, if you'd like to join us, you can contact us through social media or here on Signal. Uh, we meet, generally, we meet every Sunday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we do have a few rules and expectations that we would like our guests to adhere to while Comrade Joma is speaking. Uh, please keep your microphone muted so we can hear Comrade Joma's answers. If Joma has the time, at the end of our initial questions, we are going to go through some follow-up questions that comrades may have, and you can submit those in the live chat here on Jitsi. But please keep in mind that we likely will not be able to get through all of them. Uh, the moderators do reserve the right to remove participants who may send inappropriate questions or who violate the rules. And lastly, please just generally be courteous and respectful of Comrade Joma throughout the session. Uh, and with that, I think we can just go ahead and jump right into our first question for Joma. And that is, this question comes from Comrade Mo, and the question is, what makes a well-rounded cadre? A well-rounded cadre of the Communist Party must have revolutionary integrity and devotion to the cause of emancipating the proletariat and other exploited people and have enough ideological, political, and organizational competence to belong to a leading organ or to be a leader of a collective at a certain level of the Communist Party and any other revolutionary force uh, led by the Communist Party. In ideology, enough competence means knowing the basic principles and methods of the theory and practice of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. In politics, it means knowing the general program of the party and how to arouse, organize, and mobilize the masses. In organization, it means knowing the principle of democratic centralism and how to apply it. 
Thank you, comrade. Our second question, which also comes from Comrade Mo, is what are the limitations of the United Front and what are the positives of building United Front work? Think of the United Front as an instrument of expansion rather than as a concept or rule of limitations. If you compare the scopes and sizes of the three magic weapons of the People's War, the Communist Party is the advanced political detachment of the proletariat. It's the smallest because the ideological, political, and organizational development of cadres and members is required. The People's Army tends to be larger than the Communist Party because the minimum requirement for membership is uh, lower and the United Front tends to have the largest mass following under the various forces that are uh, allied or coalesced. The United Front is the instrument of the Communist Party for reaching the broad masses of the people in their millions in the quickest way possible. It is used to form the basic alliance of the organizations of workers and peasants, winning over the organized middle social strata and uh, taking advantage of the splits among the reactionaries in order to isolate, weaken, and destroy uh, the uh, most uh, the, the current enemy. The United Front puts together the organized forces as well as influences the masses that are not yet organized. There is the United Front for legal struggle, which is for the purpose of building the alliance of the legal anti-imperialist and democratic forces. And there is the United Front for armed struggle, which is for the purpose of building the alliance of the various forces to fight and overthrow the enemy, which may be the reactionary ruling system in the civil war or a foreign aggressor in a war of national liberation. Thank you, comrade. Our next question asks, what are comrade Joma's thoughts on which classes will be part of the masses in an imperialist country compared to semi-feudal and semi-colonial countries? In what you can observe now in the imperialist countries or most developed capitalist countries, the blue collar and white collar members of the industrial proletariat constitute the largest mass. The farm workers and the rich farmers are far smaller in number than the industrial proletariat. The urban petty bourgeoisie and middle bourgeoisie are conspicuous, but are far less uh, in number than the industrial proletariat. In the countryside of the industrial capitalist countries, there is no great mass of poor peasants as in feudal and semi-feudal countries, but there are some rich farmers who cultivate their own land and uh, uh, farm workers hired by agri-corporations. The rural population has become a small part of the national population, often no more than 25%. Agriculture has the least share of national employment, 5% or even less. And of course, the monopoly bourgeoisie is the smallest class in an imperialist country, but is the ruling class and is the wealthiest and extracts surplus value from the workers. Thank you for that answer, comrade. Our next question asks, what keeps the Filipino revolutionaries continuing to fight despite heavy losses and gains? From 1969 to the present, the general trend of the armed revolutionary movement in the Philippines has been to grow in strength. And, and um, in, uh, despite some amounts of losses at certain times, either due to the enemy's campaigns of military suppression or uh, serious errors instigated by renegades. Despite the lack of cross-border advantages due to the Philippines being an archipelagic country, the CPP and NPA have done very well in self-reliantly carrying out the strategy and tactics of people's war and waging guerrilla tactical offensives against the weakest points of the enemy and thereby accumulating armed strength as well as political strength. The Filipino revolutionaries keep on fighting because they have a just cause 
in the struggle for national and social liberation against imperialism, feudalism, and bureaucrat capitalism. They are led by the proletariat, which is the most productive and progressive class, and are guided by the theory of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. They carry out the People's Democratic Revolution through the strategic line of protracted people's war. They have been able to cause the overthrow of the 14-year Marcos fascist dictatorship and frustrate all the strategic campaigns of military suppression launched by post-Marcos regimes from that of Aquino to that of Duterte. The CPP started with 100 cadres and members in 1968, and now this number 150,000 nationwide and are deeply rooted among the toiling masses of workers and peasants. The NPA started with only nine automatic rifles and 26 inferior firearms in Tarlac province in 1969, and is now in the thousands in more than 110 guerrilla fronts in 74 provinces out of the 81 Philippine provinces. The revolutionary mass organizations and the local organs of red political power encompass millions of people. The enemy grossly underestimates the size of the NPS being only around 4,000 at the most and belittles even more the tens of thousands of members of the People's Militia and the hundreds of thousands in the self-defense core of the revolutionary mass organizations. Quite a number of people still call China social imperialist because it still calls itself socialist formally and occasionally. But it has become a full-fledged monopoly capitalist country since the Dengue's counter-revolution and overthrow of the proletariat in October 1976 through the expulsion uh, from the Chinese CP. Uh, tens of millions of uh, 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 caterers and members who had supported the great proletarian cultural revolution and consequently the full-scale and rapid capitalist restoration through capitalist reforms and integration with the world capitalist system in 1978. In more than four decades of collaboration with U.S. imperialism in carrying out the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization, China has become an imperialist power with the monopoly bourgeoisie dominant in both state and private sectors and has reached the point of becoming the chief economic competitor and political rival of the U.S. for world hegemony. The U.S. has accused China of manipulating trade and financial policy and stealing technology from U.S. companies and research institutes and has decided to decouple from China in a belated attempt to weaken it economically, politically, and militarily. Uh, China has flagrantly acted as an imperialist power towards the Philippines and the Filipino people by taking over maritime features in the West Philippine Sea, building artificial islands, and turning them into military bases in violation of the sovereign and maritime rights of the Philippines, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and uh, the 2016 judgment of uh, the Permanent uh, Arbitration Court in favor of the Philippines uh, against China. So that's the, how uh, China's Chinese imperialism concretely impacts on the Philippines. In its imperialist interest, China has prevented the Philippines from, from availing of the rich mineral and marine resources worth many trillions of dollars in its own exclusive economic zone and extended continental shelf. Filipino fishermen are often prevented from fishing in the West Philippine Sea, and the Filipino people are deprived of a large part of their seafood requirement. Thank you for answering that question, comrade. Moving on to our next set of questions here. Why is it important for the party to take a hard line stance on anti-revisionism? 
It is important for the CPP and all genuine Marxist-Leninist parties to take a resolute stand against modern revisionism because it is a bourgeois ideology masquerading as socialist. The Great October Socialist Revolution was successful because Leninism exposed and defeated the influence of the classical revisionism of the Second International. After the death of Stalin, who built Soviet socialism and directed the defeat of Nazi Germany and world fascism, the Soviet leaders from Khrushchev through Brezhnev to Gorbachev and Yeltsin from 1956 to 1991 carried out modern revisionism to undermine and destroy socialism. Subsequently, modern revisionism also prevailed against socialism in China. We have seen how in former, in former socialist countries, modern revisionism has succeeded in undermining and then destroying socialism. But modern revisionism is also a subversive bourgeois ideology against the communist parties, still waging a revolutionary struggle to seize political power from the bourgeoisie and other exploiting classes. It preaches the line that socialism is achievable through the peaceful and parliamentary road and that it can prevail over capitalism through peaceful economic competition. It seeks to mislead the proletariat and people from taking the revolutionary road of anti-imperialist and class struggle for socialism. No communist party that is polluted and misled by modern revisionism can seize political power from the bourgeoisie and establish socialism. And if a communist party has already established socialism in any country, it must be vigilant and resolute against the danger of modern revisionism. Lenin pointed out that after, its def after the, def the defeat of the bourgeoisie, it multiplies its resistance 10,000 fold, and that it takes a whole historical uh, epoch to build socialism in transition to communism. During the great proletarian cultural revolution, Mao emphasized that classes and class struggle persist within socialist society, and the proletariat must be vigilant and determined to complete its victory over the bourgeoisie. The two-line struggle continues in the socialist society. Thank you, comrade. Uh, our next question is, what forms might a left deviation take within the context of the party's political line? In relation to the correct political program and strategy and tactics already set by the party on the basis of the concrete analysis of concrete conditions in a country, uh, left opportunism or left deviation can arise when some party cadres and members fail to understand the balance of forces between the revolution and the enemy, overestimate the strength of the revolution and that of the enemy, and, uh, um, and undertake rash and uh, premature actions that seriously damage uh, the revolution instead of advancing it. The, advent the adventurist or putschist mentality comes from petty bourgeois subjectivism and uh, uh, lack of discipline. In very, in very simple terms, um, um, the, uh, the, the adventurists uh, try to make the offensive before the masses are ready uh, to carry out the offensive. Uh, for instance, in the experience of the Communist Party of the Philippines and the Philippine Revolution, a central cadre by the name of Ricardo Reyes was influenced by Trotskyism and the claims of Marcos that the Philippines had become an industrial capitalist country under his rule. Reyes spread in 1980 the subjectivist view of the Philippine economy that it was no longer semi-feudal, but already industrial capitalist. This view encouraged right opportunism among some cadres in the United Front who argued that people's war must be scaled down and that legal struggle must be scaled up. 
and um, to uh, attract more people to the United Front, uh, the leadership of the proletariat must be kicked out and uh, give um, um, a bigger role to the bourgeois anti-Marcos resistance. No, but the worst consequence of the subjectivist view was the generation of various types of left opportunism from 1981 onwards. Uh, the worst of left opportunism went by the name of red area and white area strategy in Mindanao. It promoted urban insurrectionism through so-called people strikes and intensified armed city partisan warfare and the premature formation of 15 uh, absolutely concentrated companies without maintaining relatively dispersed uh, smaller units for expanding the mass base. At first, the three, uh, first three to five NPA companies were successful in tactical offensives, but after the fifth company, the NPA companies could be easily spotted and isolated and drawn uh, to decisive engagements by the enemy. And uh, there was never any urban uh, uh, insurrection uh, occurring, but uh, um, the intensified actions of the armed city, armed city partisans uh, trying to um, um, uh, linking up and trying to uh, uh, inflame people strikes uh, uh, only served to expose the precious underground cadres in the urban areas. Uh, they were exposed prematurely. Instead of reviewing and rectifying the left opportunist line, its most rabid authors concluded that the cause of the setbacks was not the wrong line, but deep penetration agents, and decided to carry out a witch hunt, which violated due process and the correct principles and methods of investigation, evaluation of evidence and trial. Hundreds of CPP members, NPA fighters, and mass activists were falsely accused and arbitrarily punished. But eventually, the strong Marxist-Leninist Maoist foundation of the CPP prevailed. All similar occurrences of left opportunism resulting in crimes of witch hunt were stopped in a timely way. And they would still become the main target and uh, of the second great rectification movement, which was a nationwide campaign of ideological and political education from 1992 uh, to 1998. Thank you, comrade. Our next question says, um, how do the conditions for people's war differ here in the Imperial Corps compared to in semi-feudal and semi-colonial countries like the Philippines? Uh, any kind of uh, genuine armed revolution, which is led by the proletariat and engages the broad masses of the people, may be called a people's war. Uh, it can be equated with the expression armed revolution, but this is quite different from the strategy and tactics of the protracted people's war conceived of and applied by Mao in semi-colonial and semi-feudal China as well as by the Communist Party of the Philippines in the semi-colonial and semi-feudal Philippines, Mao pointed out that this kind of society is in chronic crisis and people's war can be started at any time by using the strategic line of encircling the cities in the countryside to accumulate armed and political strength over a protracted period of time and by going through the probability course of the strategic stages of defensive, stalemate, and counteroffensive. He also pointed out that the strategic line of protracted people's war is inapplicable in imperialist countries or advanced capitalist countries. We must consider that the economy and system of communications are far more unified and centralized than in the still backward China that the overwhelming majority of the people live in urban areas and that the, the agri-corporations and some rich farmers are in the countryside 
instead of a big mass of poor peasants and that if you start any armed struggle in any urban or rural community, you will be finished up within hours by the SWAT teams unless you have a large clandestine army organized well in advance and the imperialist army is already in the process of disintegration as uh, in the October Revolution uh, in Russia. However, there are infantile Maoists. They preach that protracted people's war can be started anytime in any of the advanced capitalist countries. But even after decades of their prattle, they have not started any armed revolution anywhere in the capitalist world. Even the revolutionary international movement, Grimm, which had believed that a world war would break out in the 1980s and would generate partisan warfare as in World War II, faded out. The so-called Gonzaloites are worse for claiming that protracted people's war is the greatest contribution of Mao and that Gonzalo was the one who synthesized and elevated Mao's revolutionary theory and practice uh, to Maoism as the third stage of development after Marxism and Leninism. Thank you, comrade. Our next question comes from comrade Ignacio, and it is, what are key lessons Chicanos can learn from the Philippines to apply in our struggle for national liberation? It is unfortunate that by launching a war of aggression against Mexico, the U.S. was able to obtain in exchange for uh, 15 million U.S. dollars under the Treaty, treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, more than 500,000 uh, square miles, or 1,300,000 uh, square kilometers of land from Mexico and expanded U.S. territory by about one-third. The territory grabbed included the states of New Mexico, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, California, Texas, and Western Colorado. The forced treaties like the Treaty of Paris of December um, 10, 1898, uh, in which the U.S. Uh, bought the Philippines for $20 million from Spain at the end of the U.S.-Spanish War. But this is, of, this is of smaller scale. The, the land grab from Mexico was much bigger. Um, would become much bigger uh, or uh, was much bigger in, in the middle of the 19th century. I have known Chicano or Chicano or Mexican comrades in California since the early 1990s who have organized themselves as Union Union del Barrio to adopt and carry out a political program of Chicano liberation, defending the national liber and democratic rights of the Chicano people, uh, quite a number of them hope to someday recover the territory grabbed by the U.S. from Mexico. I'm aware of the tremendous odds that they are up against. They face a gigantic imperialist power like the U.S., which invokes the 1848 Treaty of Session, collaborates with the reactionary classes and government of Mexico, and has allowed people of various nationalities uh, to stay in the former territory of Mexico and overwhelm in number the people of Mexican ancestry. Conditions for Filipinos in the Philippines are entirely different from conditions of Chicanos within the present USA. What can give hope to the Chicanos is to persevere in their continuous struggle for the right to national self-determination and for their democratic rights and welfare, develop solidarity with other oppressed peoples like they did with the Filipino farm workers in California in the middle of the 1960s when they conjoined in strikes and formed the United Farm Workers Union, always despised the land grab done by the U.S. at the expense of the Mexican people and contribute to the further strategic decline and possible disintegration of the imperialist USA in the future. The US Constitution upholds the sovereign right of the people to rebel against a government that becomes oppressive or tyrannical. 
and allows the citizens to freely bear their own arms so that the government does not monopolize these. It is possible for Chicanos to own their guns individually and legally, develop their revolutionary unity, avoid premature armed struggle, and decide for themselves when would be the correct time and circumstances to use their weapons in the revolutionary process. Thank you for that answer, comrade. Um, as far as I can tell, that is the last uh, prescribed question that we asked. And so now, um, if you are okay with it, I think that we should go ahead and move on to some questions that comrades in the chat have been asking. So um, our first live question that we got was from comrade Bella. And the question is, do you have any thoughts on strategies for mobilizing the revolutionary masses in the imperialist core itself and what that type of struggle would look like? The class line in the strategy of mobilizing the revolutionary masses in the imperialist core of the country is to have the leadership of the proletariat and its party under the guidance of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, rely mainly on the proletariat win over the middle social strata. They have been dwindling under the neoliberal policy and take advantage of the splits among the factions of the monopoly bourgeoisie in order to isolate and defeat the fascist and bellicose ruling faction at every given time. Win the battle for democracy under the leadership of the revolutionary proletariat against the monopoly bourgeoisie on immediate and long-term issues regarding class oppression and exploitation, as well as white supremacist discrimination against the people of color. The battle for democracy prepares for and extends to the seizure of political power and overthrow of the imperialist state. Learn from Lenin and the Bolsheviks. Keep on raising the revolutionary consciousness of the proletariat and the rest of the masses and keep on sending cadres into the reactionary army in order to turn the troops against the enemy and its rabid officers, especially at the decisive moment when the imperialist power is in the throes of disintegration because of violent contradictions among factions of the monopoly bourgeoisie or serious defeats elsewhere in the world. At the same time, while conditions for civil war do not yet exist in the battle for democracy, the proletarian revolutionary party can educate its members on the state and revolution, discreetly create self-defense units, accumulate arms by purchase and making them at home, and avoid being drawn into any premature violent conflicts before the conditions for civil war uh, arise. In nearly all imperialist countries, especially in the U.S., Ordinary citizens can legally acquire firearms for various reasons, like for self-defense against criminality, for home defense, and for sports. The U.S. Constitution, no less, allows the private citizens to own firearms so that the government does not monopolize them for the purpose of oppression or tyranny. A self-satisfied and expanding middle class is the bulwark of passivity in imperialist countries that present themselves as liberalized societies. But the middle class and the imperialist core of the world has been dwindling and being thrown to the worst conditions of the proletariat because of the ever worsening crisis of the world capitalist system. Many of those in the middle class call themselves the precariat, educated enough for white collar jobs but faced with the threat of unemployment or employment far below their grade. It is crucially important for the proletarian revolutionaries to win over the intelligentsia and other strata or sectors of the middle class to the side of the proletarian socialist revolution instead of letting them be swayed by fascism. The Communist Party needs progressive allies from the middle class 
ranging in character from the anti-imperialist and anti-fascist left liberals to those who are close to being recruited as proletarian revolutionaries. To be able to run effectively the future socialist society, it will be necessary to re-educate the middle strata of the capitalist system and avail of their various competencies. Thank you, comrade. Our next question comes from comrade Pacomio, and they ask, uh, Lenin and others have argued that the super profits generated from imperialism can be redistributed to some working classes of the imperialist nation, creating a bourgeoisified proletariat. In your experience and struggle, has this thesis held? What are the implications of this and how might it be overcome? It is not true that uh, uh, the working class, you know, there, there is an exaggerated view of the so-called third worldist uh, in the U U.S. that uh, uh, the entire American working class uh, is uh, labor aristocracy. I've always disagreed with that viewpoint because uh, there is always the crisis of overproduction uh, afflicting uh, the U.S. capitalist system. And you see, when they had the, this problem of stagflation, uh, and they could not solve it, uh, uh, either by stimulating uh, the economy or by uh, reducing uh, or, or by um, uh, using uh, the interest rates to control expansion, well, they, they could not solve the problem because the, the problem was that uh, uh, those capitalist countries devastated in World War II, like the, uh, in Europe and Western Europe and in Japan, they had already recovered. So the old problem of uh, the crisis of overproduction since the time of uh, uh, Marx was afflicting the system. So what did the U.S. do? It ad adopted the dominant... Uh, uh, policy of neoliberalism. Um, ne uh, the neoliberalism is the complete opposite of the classical uh, liberal theory. Uh, at least Adam Smith recognized that uh, um, material values come from the labor power of the working class. But, you know, neoliberalism denies that, no? It means uh, neoliberalism, um, the the basic proposition in neoliberalism is that uh, the bourgeoisie must have as much capital as um, it, it should have, in, supposedly, in order to, to create the jobs so, uh, and um, uh, and grow the economy. Um, and then, so what uh, does uh, neoliberalism do? Yeah? Um, cut, uh, provide all possible uh, capital in the hands of the bourgeoisie, uh, cut back on taxes on the bourgeoisie, um, liberalize uh, investments and trade, privatize uh, profitable public assets, and um, uh, denationalize uh, economies uh, outside of uh, the capitalist countries, so on and so forth. So what do you have now? You have a, you have a few billionaires in control of 60% of the economy. So the, the capitalist system has become more rotten. And the so-called middle class, well, which the U.S. used to boast of, no? uh, from uh, after the war uh, to, the, to the middle of the 70s, uh, uh, it has dwindled. No? It has dwindled. No? You have a dwindling um, um, middle class. And of course, uh, the proletariat has uh, uh, expanded, and unemployment has hit the uh, the proletariat. So it is not true that uh, uh, what the bourgeois, the super profits that the bourgeoisie would earn, uh, would be redistributed eh, to the proletariat, and that would create a bourgeoisified. Uh, uh, proletariat or even a, a labor aristocracy. Right now, you have a working class, um, a working class that is very much oppressed, exploited, disadvantaged. 
Uh, and yet, because of revisionism, uh, uh, you can trace to the revisionism and the Soviet Union down to the uh, dominance of uh, uh, revisionist parties uh, in the US and in Europe, uh, continuing to weaken the proletariat. So you really need a, 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 a communist party that is uh, uh, guided by Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, capable of criticizing not only uh, capitalism itself, but how uh, revisionism is used to uh, disarm, disarm the proletariat and give them false illusions. You know? At the moment, uh, the working class parties or the, the communist parties in Europe and in the uh, US and other advanced capitalist countries are weak and they have become susceptible to the propaganda of the monopoly bourses exactly at this time that they're suffering so much. Uh, and uh, um, even the, uh, even the so-called neo-fascist uh, um, groups uh, have been um, uh, promoted and financed in advance by the big bourgeoisie uh, to continue um, uh, having the initiative of uh, the revolutionary proletariat. So uh, the, there are conditions now to develop the uh, revolutionary proletariat under uh, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist parties. So uh, there's that uh, tough job to be performed by uh, the Maoist parties. Um, and uh, this notion that super profits made by the billionaires uh, of the world capitalist and will be redistributed. That's a silly idea, uh, uh, outrightly obvious, uh, which must be debunked. And uh, it also shows this, this uh, wrong ideas um, also indicate that there's a lot of work to do in order to um, revolutionize the consciousness and activity of the proletariat. Thank you, comrade. Our next question comes from comrade Ignacio, and they ask, does comrade Joma think the lumpen proletariat and the most developed capitalist imperialist countries can play a historically different revolutionary role alongside the proletariat, specifically in regards to the U.S., where there is a mass lumpenization and incarceration? Well, the, uh, with the proletariat suffering a lot and uh, a big number of them becoming homeless, jobless, and so on, they're out in the streets. And with the uh, uh, time lag between uh, developing a revolutionary party of the proletariat and the existing conditions where, uh, you know, the bourgeoisie, the big bourgeoisie, uh, and the revisionists have had so much influence on the working class, there's a time lag, no? So uh, you, uh, the, the, revol the proletarian revolutionaries guided by Maoism must do a lot of catching up because uh, uh, much of the proletariat is being lumpenized, no? Um, when you lose your job, your home, and so on and so forth, you can easily uh, uh, go into lumpen proletarian activities. You, you can even resort to criminal activities. No? So uh, there is a gap. Eh? The communist parties, we must accept that in the US, in North, in, in, the, uh, in North America, in Europe, and even in those uh, countries where uh, uh, capitalism was restored, no? uh, there is uh, a lot of work to do in order to build the revolutionary party of the proletariat. In the meantime, the, the, the proletarian revolutionary parties or communist parties are still small. Eh? Yeah, there, is, um, there is still a lot of leeway eh? for the big bourgeois, the monopoly bourgeoisie eh? and uh, even the criminal, criminal syndicates eh? to operate uh, in advance and also the fascist movements. No? Um, you must remember that uh, uh, the big bourgeoisie in the world uh, uh, are still comfort comfortable no? because they are not yet uh, uh, sufficiently 
uh, threatened no? by by the real genuine communist parties with big mass followings. Uh, you know, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, you will notice that uh, the um, more than ninety-five percent of the of the violence has come from the imperialists, the real terrorists. After nineteen ninety-one, who did the attack huh? uh, in the, on Iraq, and then after the nine-eleven, uh, the United States uh, and its allies were monopolizing all the violence. Huh? Um, you know the revolutionary movements in India and the Philippines. Uh, 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 in Colombia and for a while uh, in uh, Peru in the 1980s, uh, those are uh, um, those are small uh, in relation to the counter-revolutionary violence of the imperialist powers. Uh, the big the imperialist powers stole the show in terms of uh, inflict in terms of violence. Yeah? Um, uh, Think of the endless wars launched by the U.S., especially uh, since after 9-11. Uh, so you must consider this, that uh, um, uh, the, there is a, a lot of work to be done by proletarian revolutionaries in order to catch up. The conditions are there, and we have seen the series of uh, the series of uh, actions, policies, and actions taken by the imperialists. And um, um, so far, uh, they have been failing, but uh, the revolutionary movement has still to do a lot of catching up. Uh, you know, the classic anti communism uh, of uh, so called uh, uh, free enterprise capitalism. Uh, just after the war, so that is that was gone. It was replaced by it was uh, added to it was neoliberal neo-colonialism in order to extract super profits from the former colonies and from the semi colonies, um, and then that would be followed by uh, neoliberalism coinciding with revisionism uh, in the big socialist countries. Uh, which proved to be successful in uh, uh, destroying the power of the proletariat. Then after that, neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has been running for the last four decades, and it looked like it was very successful for the imperialists, but it has begun to unravel, to fail. So this is now the correct time uh, for the proletarian revolutionaries who follow Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. Uh, to do their best in order to catch up because the conditions uh, of oppression and exploitation are crying out uh, for uh, revolution. And the people are uh, uh, strongly desirous of revolution because they suffer a lot from uh, the uh, worsening conditions of the capitalist, uh, the crisis of the world capitalist system and uh, the uh, escalation of oppression and exploitation. Thank you, comrade. Our next question is, is comrade Joma familiar with Huey Newton's ideas of intercommunalism? And if so, what are his thoughts? Yes, I'm uh, sufficiently acquainted with the ideas of Newton and uh, in, uh, intercommunalism. It's a good idea in that, you know, you have the solidarity of various communities and, uh, and uh, uh, there is a reliance on the capabilities of those communities and on their cooperation in order to, uh, um, in order to uh, uh, build a revolutionary force to challenge the uh, ruling system. So I would agree with these ideas, you know. I may not uh, agree with the um, with the Black Panthers uh, showing off too much, what little firepower they had. No, they it was uh, heroic to show 
to show their determination to use firepower against the ruling system. But, uh, you know, you have a reactionary force like, uh, uh, you know, in the U.S., you have a reactionary force like the, this one, the, uh, op opposite the, uh, uh, the revolutionary blacks, uh, this uh, nation of Islam. No? Uh, you know, they have been uh, quite clever in uh, accumulating arms in the name of community self-defense. Huh? Um, so they are reactionaries, but uh, <laughs> they they know they know how to um, to use uh, uh, the U.S. Constitution, the legalities, in order to uh, justify uh, the bearing the, the the holding of arms. You know, in the Philippines, uh, um, aside from uh, before. Uh, uh, the, the New People's Army was founded, uh, the proletarian revolutionaries who were determined to build, uh, um, co rebuild the Communist Party um, uh, did two things in order to bring about uh, uh, an armed strength. Huh? Well, one was to um, uh, develop relations with the remnants with the good remnants of the old people's army. Huh? The old people's army that started with the army against Japan. Uh, you know, there were these uh, remnant groups uh, interlocked. No? At the same time, uh, the, uh, uh, the proletarian revolutionaries uh, uh, based in Manila on their own, um, uh, stole arms from armories and uh, bought arms from uh, uh, these uh, makers of uh, uh, homemakers of weapons of uh, firearms, the Paltik. So, um, so there was there were thirty six uh, or so, or even more, a little bit more firearms when the NPA was formed. No. Uh, so and there, not all those firearms acquired uh, uh, by purchases and by stealing from armories uh, uh, are actually included in the figure of uh, 35 eh, firearms, nine plus 26. Eh? Uh, there were more, a, a bit more, a bit more. I'm telling you that uh, you suddenly cannot, you cannot suddenly have an army. Uh, it, it takes an army to beat the, the imperialist army, and uh, you and um, there are three things required. Yeah, you must uh, build uh, at least the rudiments of a people's army, and try to the, accumulate strength as is as much as you can, and and you avoid decisive engagements or uh, getting prematurely exposed and getting into decisive engagements. Then, uh, uh, then uh, the time will come when you will have to inflict the feats of the enemy. And then, uh, third, uh, the imperialist army must disintegrate. And uh, like the Bolsheviks did, uh, you must send in cadres so that they will, um, they will, they, they, they become your uh, long-term. Uh, uh, long-term agents for disintegrating the imperialist army. Uh, you know, the Red Army was practically, uh, practically came from the, from the Tsarist army because the Bolsheviks were good at penetrating the imperialist army. Uh, when, the, uh, when the rulers of Russia could no longer feed and clock their troops, uh, there were the, cater, the Bolshevik caters. Uh, to form the revolutionary um, the revolutionary councils within the reactionary army. So um, uh, even the Philipp in the Philippine struggle, don't be surprised if there are prominent uh, uh, officers of the reactionary army known to side with the new people's army uh, when they become uh, exposed or they they voluntarily proclaimed themselves as supported of the NPA. Remember, General Harke, 
Huh? General Harke was uh, was uh, uh, an important general of the reactionary army, but he turned against the reactionary army, and uh, there are pro very prominent uh, um, former military officers like uh, uh, Colonel Simbu Dante Simbulan and um, uh, uh, and then of course you have captain navy captain uh, danilo bismanos so do not uh, 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 do not underestimate the value of um, uh, of uh, um, doing doing work within the reactionary army so anyway <laughs> that's going uh, that is uh, um straying already about uh, how to rely on communities and uh, uh, inter uh, and then in the combination of communities uh you know um i i made a statement a while ago that uh, uh, you have to be careful about starting any armed clash anywhere because the swat uh, is ready to swat you and to swat uh, uh, a small uh, armed group uh, uh, in just a matter of uh, minutes or a few hours. No? But, you know, in, um, you will observe that uh, there had been protracted armed struggles in Ireland and in the, in the Basque area. That's because the, the community, there is a, con a continuous community. Huh? Um, but uh, in mixed up areas um, uh, where, it is, uh, uh, where it would take more uh, revolutionary mass work and more time to do it, uh, uh, you cannot uh, escape the burden of uh, real hard work uh, in, in mass work in communities. Okay, I, I suppose uh, <laughs> I have done my best to answer the, uh, the question. Yes, that was a great answer. Thank you, comrade. Um, our next question comes from comrade Ernesto and they ask, how can Chicanos and the imperialist core develop greater solidarity with our Filipino comrades and others worldwide in the struggle to overthrow imperialism. You know, there is already a big number of Filipinos and other Asians uh, in the former, in the territories grabbed from Mexico. Uh, and so um, uh, from my personal knowledge, I know that uh, there are various communities, uh, cities, there are cities where there are large uh, communities of Filipinos and Chicanos. Uh, for instance, San Diego. San Diego, you know, Filipinos. Uh, in, uh, and, you know, Filipinos in, uh, in San Diego are often associated with the, uh, with the U.S. Armed Forces. You know? That's the biggest employer. Um, and so, you know, um, and they, they are not satisfied with... Uh, um, with uh, well, with U.S. imperialism, even if uh, uh, they they uh, uh, they can easily find co common cause, and then of course, uh, as I have pointed out, the farm workers, uh, Filipinos and Chicago Chicanos combined in the uh, from nineteen um, um, from the mid nineteen sixties, the United uh, Farm Workers uh, Organization is still the biggest. And it's an association of the, the Chicanos and Filipinos. So I think um, um, the Chicano comrades uh, you know, can do a lot to uh, um, uh, can do uh, uh, have a lot to do uh, in order to uh, uh, to in order to expand and consolidate the relations of the Chicanos and Filipinos. And mind you, huh? Um, uh, there are um, there are uh, Filipino communities starting from uh, uh, earlier centuries. You know the uh, the Spanish colonialists 
used to have uh, Filipino rowers uh, in the galleons, no? And uh, many of these Filipinos would escape, no? And uh, they would um, form communities or become absorbed uh, uh, by uh, uh, Mexican and Indian communities. So there are Filipinos in the, um, in California and parts of Nevada and Texas uh, who have been in the United States since uh, uh, as early as the 18th century. <laughs> Thank you, uh, anyway, uh, the Chicanos and the Filipinos must uh, 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 unite in the U.S. on the basis of uh, concrete conditions and uh, uh, in order to face up to current problems. Thank you, Comrade, for that answer. Our next question comes from Comrade Mo. For comrades who come from the diasporas of oppressed nations globally who are far away from their homeland, what type of struggles do the diasporas of these oppressed nations and the diasporas do to uplift their people's struggles back home? Well, I think uh, 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 what uh, we, um, uh, Filipinas, do is to uh, urge uh, Filipinos in the diaspora uh, to um, raise their consciousness, uh, get organized and mobilized in order to uh, in order to uh, uphold, defend, and promote their uh, their rights and welfare. No, but at the same time, they should uh, link up with uh, uh, the host people and. Um, and other migrant people, so they should not be just be uh, nationalist. Uh, uh, they have to mind their own uh, uh, rights and interests, but they can become stronger, more effective only if they uh, if they learn how to build solidarity, active solidarity with uh, the host uh, workers and people, because you know. If uh, they do not uh, uh, develop uh, excellent solidarity rela relations with the host people, then, you know, uh, it's the chauvinism uh, and the fascism of, uh, um, of, uh, ult of reactionary groups that would, in would, that would be influencing uh, the the host people against the, the migrants, no? And of course, the Filipino migrants must link up also with the Filipino migrants. And if, uh, if Filipino workers are invited to the unions of the host people, they must join up, no? And uh, so, um, uh, so that uh, they have uh, developed, they develop strong links um, uh, with the host uh, workers and the host people. Um, you know, the, the, the big bourgeoisie uh, in, does a lot of intrigue uh, against uh, the migrant workers. Uh, the, the host workers are told, oh, your, your jobs are being taken away uh, by these foreigners. Uh, well, in the first place, the bourgeoisie, uh, uh, the big bourgeoisie in the developed countries um, has uh, made it a point to get migrant workers in order to take the place of their loss of colonies eh? um, and uh, by attracting workers to migrate to, to the um, home grounds of uh, monopoly capitalism. Um, so uh, that takes the place of the old colonialism. No? Um, and uh, so uh, it's really important for uh, Filipinos, comrades in the diasporas uh, from the oppressed nations uh, to be conscious of their uh, distinct nationality. And then at the same time, they must be able to have 
anti-imperialist solidarity and proletarian internationalism, eh? this, uh, inspiring their relations with uh, the host uh, of the, uh, the workers and other migrants in the uh, host country. So, and there may be eh, second, third, and further generations of Filipinos uh, who can opt to become uh, citizens if uh, of, of the host country, uh, if the laws of the host country would allow. Eh? So, uh, but then they should never, the, these children of the original um, uh, uh, migrants in the earlier diaspora should not forget eh, uh, uh, about the homeland uh, of their parents and uh, they should share with their parents the desire to be of help uh, to the revolutionary movement uh, in the countries they, they had come from. Thank you, comrade. Our next question is, our study group is about to finish a reading of Araling Activista. Are there any texts that have had a strong influence on your political understanding that you would recommend for a study group such as ours? And what is the role of group study in a revolutionary organization? Well, uh, I congratulate uh, I, uh, your study group uh, for being about to finish uh, uh, Ara. Uh, Araling Activista, and uh, you yourself, uh, I presume, have, uh, have already a high degree of understanding the importance of having this Araling Activista. And um, uh, so you have an idea uh, of how to improve uh, uh, the, how the uh, study group is conducted, you have the text uh, um, that uh, have given you some amount of mooring. Um, they have they serve uh, as a kind of anchor and you will know exactly how to improve on such text or improve the selection of such text. Um, the role of uh, group study is very important, you see, especially when you are trying to build a party uh, a revolutionary party that, that is uh, uh, under conditions where um, any embryo or any beginning of such a party is still small and weak. So the, uh, the best way for you to have quality members would have to have study groups. Because uh, uh, let us learn from Lenin. What did he say? Eh? Without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. So the study group is an instrument for bringing about uh, revolutionary theory uh, as a necessary element in the building of a revolutionary organization, party, or movement. No? So um, we, we did the same thing in the Philippines. It was to, through study circles or study groups. Uh, the same thing, it was, that was done in uh, Russia in the time of Lenin, huh? in the building of the Bolshevik party, they did, uh, they, they used the study circles. So that was also the case in China, study circles or study groups. That's the only way you can, uh, you, cannot have to, you cannot have the big thing. Anyway, even when you have the big thing, like a strong uh, revolutionary party ready to topple the ruling system, uh, you must have the yeah, you must have the particles and the molecules to begin with. No, you must have the you must have the embryos through the uh, through the study groups and study circles. Thank you for that answer, comrade. Our next question comes from comrade Cougar, who asks, "Where does your strength and determination come from?" How do you remain so vigilantly dedicated to the revolution, even through the oppression you have endured? Is it a love for the people that gives you strength? You can call it a love for the people or um, uh, a love for the just cause. You know? uh, love for the people and having the just cause. You know? uh, because when you mention cause, then 
uh, you are uh, required um, to do something about it, no? Um, because if you end uh, end up with uh, just love, is a senti- it can only end up as a sentiment. But when you speak of a cause for the love of the people, then you are required eh, to do very concrete things in order to bring about revolutionary change, no? So you don't just have a desire, a love for the people, and you don't just have a cause. You have to, but when you mention a cause, then uh, you know that you have the people to rely on and the means to be able to to develop the instruments for advancing uh, the people's revolutionary struggle and for seizing political power from the bourgeoisie. In my case, um, it, it's true. Uh, the, the love for the people uh, and the um, recognition of the just cause and uh, uh, the joy, the joy, uh, including the hardship uh, of uh, developing the means uh, to advance the revolution and defeat the enemy. Uh, the, the challenge is also important. No? If you are not challenged, uh, uh, love is good. It's a kind of giving, recognizing uh, something that you can give to the people, but it, it can just be a desire. No? Then recognition of the just cause is uh, you know, begin to think of what uh, people and what forces and what means you can devise. But the challenge uh, drives you. Uh, uh, it drives you uh, every day. Uh, that's what Lenin observed of uh, Stalin, no? Uh, ah, that guy really, uh, uh, Lenin himself uh, uh, spent every minute of his life uh, thinking of revolution. But when he met Stalin, he also noticed the same characteristic, always thinking of how to advance the revolution. <laughs> they, uh, if you are not challenged, uh, if, uh, you might as well become, you, you will tend to become passive, no? uh, let things be. No? Uh, when you are challenged, you're always finding a way how to advance things. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, comrade. Um, and with that, we seem to be approaching about 90 minutes. So we want to take this opportunity to ask our final question from all of us. Uh, dear Ka Joma, are there any last words of wisdom for us as a study group? Well, my last word would be, I hope that uh, I have uh, um, uh, contributed to you uh, some bit of enlightenment through our exchange. And uh, uh, the question, I also learned from the questions uh, um, because uh, they, they show your interest, your level of uh, uh, consciousness and uh, your determination to advance your work. You know? Uh, those things show. And uh, for me to learn such things uh, uh, also inspire me. And so I hope that uh, our uh, webinar uh, has involved uh, mutual learning, um, mutual inspiration, and uh, uh, it involves raising our mutual determination to advance the revolution. Thank you very much, comrade. Uh, we really appreciate appreciate you taking the time to uh, sit down with us and answer some questions from some uh, young revolutionaries from around the world. Um, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all the comrades for attending. We really appreciate it. Hopefully we can talk to comrade Joma again soon. Maybe we can do some karaoke. Um, but uh Again, if any of our comrades in attendance would like to become a regular member of our study group, you can feel free to contact any of us through uh, social media or in our signal chat. 